I want to see that. Yeah. Anyway, announcements. So first we have our Wednesday night services. So that is community prayer this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Make sure you're there. It is so important that we pray as a community and build each other up in the body of Christ. So 7 p.m. in the main sanctuary. Be there or be square. Oh, she said it. All right, next D2LO class starts March 17th. Register at the Welcome Center or online at WCF.ca. Registration closes on the 13th. That's this Wednesday. Yeah, today's so the 10th. So sign up today. Why wait? Yeah. Why put it off? Do it now. You won't want to miss it. If you've never taken D2LO before, I encourage you. It's part of our culture here at WCF, so don't miss out. What does D2L stand for? Oh, Design to Lead Orientation. There you go, Not yes. like some Star Wars reference or something that I thought before. Anyways. Luke, Luke, I am your father. Anyway, <laughs> um, so we have baptism. So our last Sunday of each month is when we do baptism only at 9 a.m. service. You come for 11 a.m., better luck next time. So make sure you're there at 9 a.m. if you are wanting to get baptized. You've got to set that on your heart. So. Yay! Okay, next. Come on, Bo Cafe. Don't forget to head over to the Bo Cafe for drinks, amazing drinks. What did you have this morning? Uh, um, a chai latte with lots of cinnamon. Extra cinnamon, Extra cinnamon, guys. cinnamon, because that's what I needed this morning. He didn't need it. But go check them out. They have, they have gifts, too. So their hours of operation are Sundays, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 8.30 p.m., so go check them out. So good. All right, guys, so Easter is coming up. That is an amazing holiday. We love Easter. So we have two services for that. We have the Lamb, which is Good Friday service, and that is from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Then we have the Lion, and that is our Sunday morning service, and that is the 9 a.m. and the 11 a.m., like typical Sundays. Clearly, you guys are here for the 11 a.m., so hopefully you know how that works by now. Anyway, but, you know, we love Easter, so make sure you are there to receive. We got the Lion and the Lamb bringing in that song. Yeah, it'll be oh, good. Yeah. Lion and the Lamb, come on. We and love it. Also, we have little Jesuses everywhere, so seek me and you will find me. So look around the church. Honestly, a lot of the first service might have taken yeah. most of yeah, Jesus. Take them. But you can take them. when you find one, you can grab it like it's yours. Like keep that Jesus. But also, we want you to take a picture of Jesus. And then we want you to post it on your socials and tag WCF and tell us where you met Jesus. How you met him, where you met him. Tell us your story. Not like the little one. You yeah. don't need to know like I found Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> but tell us where you personally <laughs> like, found oh, Jesus in your I life. I met Jesus in 2005. Well, I didn't because I wasn't born then, because I'm actually quite young myself. Yeah, it's just a young um, But if you did meet Jesus in 2005, that is great, good for you. But like, make sure you let us know how you encountered Jesus. Personally. You can also find Grace Lindu after service. There's a big board out front in the main foyer. Go find her, and she will take a picture and a little video of where you found Jesus. Service. Yeah. You said service. Oh, service. All right. Service. Service. All right, guys. So make sure you stay connected. Lord knows that all of you guys are not here to hear these announcements all the time. Yes. So make sure you stay connected and sign up for our newsletter because everything we are saying is on there as well. So. Yeah, don't miss out. We want you guys to um, join us for worship, though. So let's dive in let's right dive now. Dive in. Good morning, church. How's everybody this morning? Did you guys come expecting? Amen? Well, we're gonna do something that might that some of you might feel a little bit uncomfortable. If you can stand with me, and we're gonna raise our hands and we're gonna and we're gonna invite God into this room right now. We're gonna lift our voices together and we're gonna sit and praise him and say, Father, the only reason why we're in this building, the only reason why we're gathered together here is for you. Amen. So let's lift our voices.
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. So I surrender all. And I 
we surrender to a God who is greater, who is greater and is worthy of our praise, who's worthy of our lives. Open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do everything is crumbling, when we feel empty. Father, we need you. We run into your arms because you are our safety. You are our hiding place. Father, we'll be open to you right now in this moment. We would surrender. Hardness melt and the walls crumble as we are in your presence this morning so that you can reach in and touch us and supply what we need in our life. Thank you, Father, that your arms are always open wide, always. Thank you for loving us that much. to let it all go and I 
better than we could ever imagine. So Father, I just I pray that we would trust you. That when we're struggling, when we need you, when we're down and out, even when we're doing well, Father, that we would trust you and still run to you every time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for your love. 
Thank you, Father, for your presence that is here among us right now. Thank you, Jesus. wife Cynthia and today we are reading from Genesis the first chapter verses 24 through 31 in the New Living Translation. Then God says let the earth produce every sort of animal each producing offspring of the same kind livestock small animals that scurry along the ground and wild animals and that is what happened God made all sort of wild animals livestock and small animals each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw it, and it was good. Then God says, Let us make human beings in our own image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all wild animals on earth, and small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the bird in the sky, and all animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth, and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given you every green plant as food for all wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. Have, Have a great, great day, WCF. Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? You guys seem a lot more awake than first service. Woo you guys, like, lost an extra hour, but, like, you still got to sleep in, so it's okay. So you, you guys are like, alive. Amen. So they're awake and you alive. They're awake. So my name is Abby. And I'm Pastor Mitch. All right. So junior youth, you guys are dismissed. Kids who are in Kids on the Rise, grades one to five, you guys are to remain in service today. We do not have a teacher for you. So another, I'm going to stick a plug out right now, actually. So if you guys are interested in working in Kids Church, please go see Pastor Anthony or Chantel because we are always looking for more serving team members. So, you know, if you guys just want to volunteer, you just have not done any, you know, sorry, if you want to serve, uh, if you have not served in the church yet, this is a great opportunity to serve. So just putting that out there. Yes, lots of opportunities to serve. More serving team members, right? We're all a family community, so please get involved and help out. Chantel's just over there. So just come find her after service. Yeah, um, she would love to talk with you. Um, Matthew 23, verse 23, I want to go into tithes and offering. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So what I'll talk about this morning is just how God is calling all of us to be obedient in each and every area of our lives. And it's a heart thing. It's more than just tithe. It's more than just your offering. It's a heart thing. It's in every single area. It says in the word, right? Yes, your tithe. Yes, give. Yes, give your offerings. But at the same time is why are you giving? Check your heart. Check every single area of your life when you're giving your tithes and your offering. God, God wants your whole life. He wants every single area. And so as you're giving this morning, it's not something I have to give it. But remember why. Remember the importance of, hey, God, I'm giving this to you, trusting you with everything. Trusting you with my finances. Trusting you with whatever, my car, my job, my groceries. Whatever you need are in need of this morning. It's, God, I trust you. I'm stepping out and saying, God, this morning that I'm letting go and surrendering to you. And I know that you'll bless me. I know that you'll be there with me. And there's countless times over and over again. Abby said this first, I think it's good to know. That's like, we don't realize the times in our lives sometimes where God is like showing up always because of our obedience, because our yes. But if we weren't to be obedient, then we would realize quickly mm -hmm. the things in our life, the areas in our life that was like, oh man, I need the Lord. When we try to do things ourselves, so I encourage you this morning is to give with an open heart. But let's pray for our tithes and offering. God, I just thank you 
for this seed that you've given us, that you blessed us with. I thank you that we have the opportunity to pour back out and to love others. I pray that you bless this. I pray that wherever it goes, God, that it would continue to advance the kingdom of God, that it would continue to bless people, to change lives and hearts for you. That, Lord, I thank you that you've been so good to us. And you keep pouring out your love again and again and again. So I thank you that we have the opportunity to bless others. And I thank you that you're going to move in and through our lives. You know what each and every one of us needs. So I thank you that you bless each and every person here as they sow into the kingdom. In the name of Jesus and everyone said, amen. amen. So multiple ways that you can give. Um, we have ushers. Teddy's coming down in the middle. Shout out to Teddy again. Um, so if you want an envelope, um, there's the Welcome Center after service. Um, there's also online. You can give through e-transfer at giving at wcf.ca. Just put what you're giving towards in your name. And then we have the mobile app. So multiple ways that you can give. Um, but yeah. Giving made easy, modern easy. way. Easy. <laughs> All right. So last week we wrapped up our Deconstructing the Deconstruction series. And this week we're starting a new one. Who knows the song Days of Elijah? These are the days of Elijah. Yeah, Jen knows it. Jen knows yeah, Jen's it. In so it. we're actually talking about the days of Noah this time, not Elijah, although Elijah's pretty great too. You just um, threw them off. They're all like excited and then, oh, days of Noah. Okay. Yeah. Days of Noah this time. Anyways, so we, Pastor Larry and Pastor RJ are going to deliver a message on that. Let's welcome them up. This is fun. Good morning. Hello. Oh, I know how many of you switched from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock. <laughs> we still had to be here uh, early. You were here earlier than I. Uh, not by much. I had an iron explode on me this morning. Oh, and you blamed it on your kids. No, I did not. <laughs> he didn't. I did not. Uh. So, welcome everybody. Days of Noah Part 2. Was anyone here when we did the original Days of Noah series? Oh, a few of you remember that. Okay. Well, you guys have been here a while. So, this is a fun format for those of you that are a little bit newer. We are going to try to have a conversation like we're sitting in our living room. Uh, today Ish. was... Yeah, today was a little bit more um, teachy, but it's foundational. And then sometimes we'll have other uh, persons up here with us sharing on their expertise uh, with us. And um, it's kind of a fun way to have the Word of God communicated a little bit different. It mixes it up. Uh, you have to be patient with me as I'm getting used to this format again. <laughs> it's been a while since we've done this together. It's been a while, and, and it, took, it takes me a second, but that's okay. We'll get there. I am kind of hard to preach with. No, I did not say that. <laughs> Everybody's hard to know. The, uh, the thing I want you to get foundationally as we go into this, and this lesson is the foundation stone for all of the other conversations. Yeah. Can everyone say this lesson? This lesson. So if you have a friend who misses this week and they come in next week, they're missing core foundational pieces to the message and they won't necessarily end up where we want them to. Did I say that right? Yeah, it sounds good. Okay. It's very accurate. So 2 Corinthians 2.11, so that Satan will not outsmart us for we are familiar with his evil schemes. And how many know that Satan has evil schemes? Have you ever fallen prey to one of those? Yeah. Some of you are like, I don't know what his evil schemes are. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you came. We're here to talk about those. But we want to identify and be aware of Satan's schemes against humans. That's where we want to start. We want to, we want to identify his schemes. We want to be aware because we don't want to fall prey to them. Has anyone ever fallen prey to a prank? Yep. My favorite prank. <laughs> so I don't know why I do this, but I learned a long time ago that people are generally gullible. 
And when you have a nice piece of cake sitting in front of you with pretty icing, I just casually walk up to people and say, hey, did you see that green icing? It actually smells like pine trees. And what does the average person do? Now, a few years ago, I stopped actually shoving people's face in the icing, and I, and I just uh, let them know that I could. Okay. How many of you have fallen prey to Satan's schemes? But when you don't know what his schemes are, it's easier for you to fall prey to that, is it not? Okay. Go ahead. That we can know truth and discern lies about who God is and how he's operating in the earth today. And uh, <clears throat> that's a big one because how many of you know all truth? No, probably nobody. There's more that I don't know than there is that I do. And that's exactly it, right? But the key is to have the Holy Spirit to guide us into discerning lies and to constantly be testing everything by the Word of God to know what is truth and what are lies. We want to leave this series of conversations with hope mm -hmm. and with moral courage, courage to do the right thing and to withstand and to be aware of how the enemy's operating so we don't fall into it. Yeah. And then also that we are not deceived by the subtle twists uh, to the word of God. And Satan is masterful at doing that, um, as we see um, in the passage, which we're going to talk about, about the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, though, uh, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. When in the garden, Adam and Eve surrendered to sin, and Satan, ruler of this world, little r, but nonetheless, he's the God of this world, he blinds the minds of people who are in unbelief, people that don't believe. They can't see the light of the good news of the gospel. They don't understand the message of hope. And this is something that he is still doing today with people because he doesn't want people to get the truth of God's word into their heart so that they start living as an image bearer, which is what we're going to get to in a moment. You know, and there's, there's so much that we can pull from that passage because the reality is that for every single one of us, even though we don't consider ourselves as unbelievers, there's areas in our life where we struggle with believing. And, uh, and this is where the enemy will jump on, on the areas where we are not believing. Could be believing for health, could be believing for finances. It could be believing about our abilities and the authority that we do have. Like there's so many areas in our life where it is so important that we do believe and the word is the source of that. Yeah. In Matthew 24, 36, I'm going to start reading in the Amplified Bible. But of that exact day and hour, no one knows. Jesus is talking about his return. Not even the angels in heaven nor the son and his humanity, but the father alone. For the coming of the son of man, the Messiah, will be just like the days of Noah. So then Jesus is giving us this picture. Well, what was happening on planet Earth at the time that Noah lived with the flood, right? For in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the very day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know or understand until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be unexpected judgment. That verse 38 yeah. It's, it's, it's describing what the days of Noah were like. But as I read it, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. That doesn't sound that bad. I mean, we eat, we drink, we marry, we give in marriage. So what's the big deal? Maybe there's a little bit more to the story. Hmm. Okay, so it sounds kind of like uh, maybe like like modern day reporting. They just give a part of the story that caters to the message they want to give and it sounds all glorious, but there's maybe a little bit more to that story. Yes. 
I, I would think so. Like in Genesis 6, verse 5, where it says, describing the days of Noah, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So what you're saying, according to that scripture, is the people that were living, with the exception of maybe Noah and his family, everything that they thought or imagined was evil. Yeah. Like, I, I can't even begin to imagine. Like, to have a mindset that is constantly focusing on evil, what was that world like? Pretty messed up. <laughs> God judged that world. And, and yet, the Bible is saying that the end time is going to be just like that. This is true. So this is why foundationally it's really important that we understand today that you are made in the image of God. Can everyone say, I was made in the image of God? Because see, God made male and female in his image. He made you in his image. And part of this, and we'll develop this as this goes through, as image bearers, there's a right to govern that was given to Adam and Eve in the garden. Because they were made in his image, they were given the right to really rule and reign on planet Earth and to govern or steward the planet and its resources might be a better way to say it. But nonetheless, Satan from the beginning has attempted to steal and usurp this right to govern Earth from humans because he wants to lead people in worship to himself and not to the creator. You know, this is, this is really where deception comes in and, and and this is the hub or the focal point of our series I think where humans um, deceived by the spirit serpent. by the serpent sorry are not content to be image bearers of the creator they desire to take his place and um, you know it's it's an uh, an aspect of of pride it's an aspect of needing to be in control where knowingly or unknowingly, you know, we give in to those concepts and we take the role of God and we, we live it out on, on our own. Yeah. In our own ability, in our own strength. I, I see this as a huge problem even in churches. Maybe even in this church. No. It, it, it can happen anywhere to anyone. But the moment that you allow the serpent or Satan to deceive you, you become discontent bearing the image of God that he has made you to be. And then as a result of that, you put yourself in God's place. Now you say, well, I would never put myself in God's place. But anytime you're operating in pride or self-will or anytime you're taking the glory that really belongs to God. Like, for instance, our worship team does a great job leading us into the presence of God preparing the way, singing songs, bringing joy, exhorting us, encouraging us. But if any one of the members of that team were to walk off the platform and go, man, I did a great job today. Yeah. Look how great I did. As opposed to look what God did through us as we ministered with our gift to people. Right? And, and you know, we minister, we talk, we teach, we preach, at the end of the day, it's, is it a good message? Is it a bad message? Is it a great message? The truth is, I have to listen to what the Spirit of God's telling me to yeah. say and say it. And if I please him, I'm happy. And if he gets the glory, it's set up properly. But as soon as I start making people follow me, or as soon as I start pointing people to how great RJ is, as opposed to how great God is, I'm taking the place of God. I want, I want the glory that belongs to him. And that's a very dangerous place for us to be as humans. But if you fall for the lies of the enemy in one area, you're more susceptible in others. And then as soon as you become discontent representing Christ on planet Earth as an image bearer, it puts you in a place where you're going to want to start taking yeah. the place that God has. You know, and with that as well, I think also from another perspective, if I begin to compare, I don't sing as good as them on stage or I don't preach as good as Pastor RJ. You know, even in that, that the way. focus is on me, right? Yes. And, uh, and so, you know, in that comparing, we're doing the exact same thing. 
Absolutely. So we have a lot of misinformation going on in the culture today about our identity as humans. Yeah. Okay. I'll read Genesis 3, then maybe we can talk about the context of this. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? I find it amazing that one of the ways that Satan operates is he casts doubt on the character, the goodness, the intent, and the nature of God in that statement. Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden we're not allowed to eat. God said, now, now here's where Eve got herself in trouble. You must not eat it or even touch it, but I don't remember God telling her not to touch it. He just said, don't eat it. So now she's twisting it already. And if you do, you'll die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows your eyes will be opened up as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. I know you have something to say. Just give me one second. If you have a struggle identifying as made in the image of God. So in other words, if you don't believe that God made humans in his image, man and woman, then you will believe any other foolish concept out there. For instance, there's a popular theory that's been debunked and disproven, but nonetheless, people still adhere to it. That you evolved from monkeys. Okay. Evolution is actually dead in the water as a scientific theory. It's been yep. disproven. Yep. Not just mathematically, but scientific. Anyways, nonetheless, the point is foolishness. Okay. But if you're not made in the image of God, then what are you made in the image of? You believe a lie that you, so your identity is off of its base because you're not child of God. You're cousin of monkey. Okay. And, and, <laughs> But the problem is with identity, if you're not identifying as made in the image of God, then how are you ever going to carry the authority and the power that Christ won for us at the cross so that we can live and move and have our being in him and do the things he's called us to do and fulfill the assignment on our life? And that leads us even to a greater problem in our culture today because now we're so confused about our identity, we don't even know the difference between man and woman as a culture. Okay, what God made man and God made woman in his image. We get confused on this, but that kind of has to happen. So if people can't select their gender, how are we ever going to get to the place where we start selecting our species? Yeah. Us. What did you say this morning? I am a cat. Yeah, I'm a cat. Go ahead. Yeah. I know you've got some stuff on that. Well, you know, um, because you went off, I completely forgot what it was. <laughs> but that's okay, because, you know, sometimes we distance ourselves and we, you know, we read stories in Scripture, like this, this story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And, and well, that was then, and, and we don't understand how it actually relates to us today. But Paul brings it back, you know, into a reflection of, of how this can affect me. And in, in alignment with the attack on the image bearers, 2 Corinthians 11, chapter th uh, verse 3, uh, in the Amplified, it says, But I am afraid that even as the serpent beguiled Eve by his cunning, your minds may be corrupted and led away from the simplicity of your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now, if anybody on earth was pure, in their thoughts, in their character, in their, in their being, it was Adam and Eve. They were as pure as pure can be, undefiled by sin. And if Satan in his cunning can deceive them, how much more us? How much more us today? And so, you know, the reality is this, and this is where we really need to be aware and on guard of the devil's schemes. It's not something that we can just distance ourselves and say, you know, I've got this. It's, it's something that it's a constant every day. Be on guard and be aware that in some subtle way, he's going to come in and deceive. And I mean, 
mess us up in our thinking, in our, in our actions, in our, in our, you know, we respond to something out of emotion instead of out of, you know, a proper thought process or whatnot. So, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, and remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. Yep. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him, speaking of these things in all his letters. Some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of the scripture, and this will result in their destruction. It's the subtle twist. It's the slight twist to the word of God that's starting to create a lot of problems in our culture today. And the Bible warns and warns and warns and warns again and again and again about false teachers and ravenous wolves that are gonna come in and scatter the people because we know and understand that people are gonna twist the scriptures and pervert the truth of the word of God. So it's really important for us as Christ's followers, to understand what the word is saying to us and to read it and to know it so that we don't fall for lies. And I think I gave you a lie last week about how many of you believe that Jesus is the first created, you know, greatest created. If you don't know the scriptures, you can't quickly identify that that's a false statement. Yeah. And there's people out there today that twist the scriptures to fit their belief system. I mean, people try to justify all kinds of things, all kinds of sin. And they try to twist and pervert the scripture to their, under, but, but it's a distortion of truth. And that's exactly it. It's a distortion of truth, and it, and it ends up being a distortion of who God is. Yes. Right? Because that's the foundation. Who is God? Mm -hmm. And then who am I in reference to that? And, and, and that's exactly it. Who is God? Do you know who he is? Because if we don't know the truth of who he is, then we are easily deceived, right? Um, Satan's scheme is to distort our understanding of who God is. In turn, when we don't get a clear, under, a clear understanding of who he is, we will never understand who we are or what his purpose is for our lives. We never will. Go ahead with real faith. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. There's a quote from um, Real Faith that I found was very fitting you know, we're, we're talking about the importance of knowing who we are in regards to the authority. And um, there is no authority in all creation equal or superior to God the Father. When he says Jesus is the Son of God, that is a forever fact. That'll never change. With the Trinity present at Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit comes down in power Jesus uh, to empower Jesus to live out um, his God-given identity and now does the same for Christians. Let's talk about that. Okay. Rather than the next part. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live the Christian life. So see where Adam and Eve were given, no, they were not born with, uh, theologians call it a propensity to sin or this tendency towards sin. They weren't. They had innocence and pureness, but then Satan tricked them and then they fell into sin. After Adam and Eve, all humans have this tendency towards sin. In other words, you're not gonna conquer sin 100% of the time. At some point in your life, you're gonna break one of God's laws. And all of you did. Yeah. Probably all of God's laws. Wait, what? <laughs> That's true. But what happens is, okay, what happens is, when you come to Christ, you become a new creation. Some of you get it. You're a new creation. You get born again. It's a fresh, it's a new beginning in Christ. And what happens is the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells within you and he gives you the ability to live the Christian life. Yeah. He gives you the ability to make right decisions. He gives you the ability to listen to God and hear his voice and obey. He gives you the ability to step out of your, I'll call them, inhibitions or your limitations and move beyond into the things that God has assigned for your life to do. Did I explain that good? Yep. Okay, go ahead to the next part at the bottom there. If Satan. So if Satan can have us believe that we're not worthy of that authority, that God is holding back on us, so why bother going to him? 
or that we need to do something special in order to gain that authority, then the devil's won. He's won. We need to believe and have the conviction of what God's word says. And that's, you know, how many times in the word does it, does it tell us that we're supposed to go to the word? And in, in, in Ephesians, Paul even calls it the sword of the spirit for a reason, because that's how we go to war. That's how we do battle against the enemy, with the word. Talk about that conviction a little bit. The conviction? Yeah, talk about conviction. Convictions are established in the heart. Um, you know, we often say that we believe certain things about God's word. For example, I can say I believe that God is sovereign. But when trouble comes, if I cave into that trouble, then God is no longer sovereign in my life. And so I have head knowledge that God is sovereign because I've read it how many times the Bible says so, but there's no belief in my heart that dictates the way I live my life in agreement to the sovereignty of God, that he can sustain me through the difficulty and the hardship and the trouble and the persecution. But so many times as Christians, the moment that we come under attack we want to cave. And, we, you know, no longer are we valid servants of the kingdom because I'm under attack. Mm -hmm. But if that was the case in the Bible, would Paul have accomplished anything? Probably not. He even had prophets tell him, don't do it. He's yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I already know. God already told me. <laughs> this is what's supposed to happen. They called it right. He just, the average person wouldn't like the outcome. How many of you, if I told you, if you walk out those doors today, you're going to get arrested and taken to prison? How many would say, I don't want to go out those doors? Yeah. But if that's the assignment on your life, guess what? You need to walk happen. through those doors. Colossians 3.10. And have put on the new spiritual self who's continually being, sorry, who is being continually renewed in true knowledge in the image of him who created the new self. We need to have this conviction. God made us a new creation, the new spiritual self, as it says here in the Amplified. And we have to be renewed in the knowledge to the image of the one who made us. So that means that we as Christians or Christ followers are taking on the image and the nature of Christ in this life. Yeah. Right now, we put on the new self and he gives us the knowledge or the ability to start applying the word of God to our life and he we do this by abiding in him. We do this by spending time with him. We do this by listening to his voice, by reading his word, and fellowshipping with other believers. Yeah. Among other things. Yeah. And that's why we receive, and then we have to guard. Yes. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's it. We will always live our life in agreement with what's in our heart. And so when we receive and we believe in the conviction of who he says we are, in what the word says about our abilities as believers and the authority that we have, and we walk that out and we guard our heart, we win. Christ wins. So if we were to try to define image bearers for people or some of the things that image bearers do, what would be the first things that pop into your mind? The first thing that pops into my heart, into my mind is, is just being an instrument of love in every situation to all people equally. Jesus represented the fullness of the love of the Father. And, and you know, when I think of being his image bearer, that's for me personally, that's always the first thing that comes to my mind. And that's why I love being in that foyer because it gives me an opportunity to love everybody that comes in those doors. And the truth is, every person is an image bearer. Exactly. And we have to interact with other people as image bearers, even if they're confused in their identity. Yeah. Some people were made in the image of God, but they're not in 
relationship with the Father. And as a result of that, they get very confused about who they are and why they're here or how they're supposed to live or even what's right and wrong. People are redefining right and wrong according to their own perspective, but God is the one who sets right and wrong. Yeah. And we have to love people. And, and being an image bearer, I represent Christ who made me in every arena. And then we have to try to take on his actions and his character and his attitude. And we have to interact with people as he interacted with people. Yeah. With love. Yeah. In humility, in kindness, in goodness. And as, as image bearers, we are going to fail at times. Yes. And that's why it is so critically important we don't become judge and jury, mm -hmm. but we love. Yeah. We embrace, we love, we encourage growth, maturity, but we love it. We do it in love. Because the truth is we live in a culture of death. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have things like euthanasia, abortion, mm -hmm. and all this medical assistance and dying. We'll do actually a whole lesson or a whole conversation on this. Um, we'll call it medical malpractice. But the truth is, these are just symptoms of rebellion against God and his ways. And, and there's a thing, though, that I think we all need to understand. We should treat others with respect, dignity, and honor. Yeah. Okay? And, and I'll comment on this just because I feel like so many people get sucked into. They don't understand the honor and the dignity of life that A, God has given us, or they don't represent themselves as an image bearer. And, you know, I hear more and more people fall prey to this and they dress like everybody else or they dress like the world system around them or they reveal parts of their body that should be more uh, sanctified or more, more uh, covered up, right? And there's industry built on sex in like pornography and advertising, it's built on sex. Now remember, sexuality outside of Christ, if you're confused on your identity, that's the highest form of human expression for you, is your sexuality. Um, that's why it's important that we understand we're made in the image of God. But this porn industry, it is not an industry that dignifies humans. No. It takes things that God put within the marriage covenant and it's dignified, and it's made them very undignified, and it's lowered people's view of each other. Yeah. It doesn't produce loving relationships. It produces lust and taking advantage of people and putting people down. Yeah. You know, and, and then the follow-up to that is um, when we step out of our understanding of who we are, as an image bearer, I think at times we fall prey to then want to express it out with our mouths. Mm -hmm. And uh, James 3, 7 to 11 says, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? And I like the, uh, the you know, Luke 6, 45, where it says, A good person produces good things from the treasure of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasure of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. And so if there's this tendency, you know, to want to speak things that don't honor and glorify God, we got to really evaluate what's in our heart. This happens even in your own internal conversations that you have with yourselves. Every time that you look in the mirror and you tell yourself you can't do it, you can't fulfill the assignment on your life, you tell yourself you're not worthy, you tell yourself you're not qualified. Scripturally, what I see is when God puts an assignment on your life, he gives you the qualification to accomplish the assignment. Yeah. That's what I can see. 
you know, David didn't have a lot of training as a warrior. He had training as a shepherd. But God took that training as a shepherd for David and converted it and made him a warrior on the field so that he could use a sling and take down his giant. Okay? God has equipped you and prepared you with life and the things that you've gone through to get you to the place that you are. And when you accept the assignment on your life, you got to stop telling yourself, I can't, I can't, I can't. That's right. Because it's incongruent incongruent with truth. It's not truth. It's a lie that you've come into alignment with and agreement with. And most of the time, people never become all that God wants them to be because they never remove the limitations that they've placed on themselves. Or they've come into agreement with lies about who they are and who God made them. And God has made you in his image and likeness. He's made you his son or his daughter, one generation you're not a stepson of God or a stepdaughter. You're his sons and his daughters. And he's given you, Jesus has given us his authority. He's given us the Holy Spirit so that we can live right and make good decisions and that we can overcome sin and temptation and that we can live a victorious life. Yeah. <clears throat> Romans 8, 29 from the Amplified. For those whom he foreknew, and loved and chose beforehand, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and ultimately share in his complete sanctification so that we would be the firstborn, the most beloved and honored among many believers. What a, what a powerful verse. You know, all his creation all his creation, all his created human beings, sons and daughters are predestined, are chosen. But we have to choose. We have to choose to follow and to live in agreement with the truth of his word or reject it. True. So to conclude today, before we go to the table um, for communion, we are made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah. The Bible says he made male and female in his image and his likeness. So each of you, male and female, are made in the image and likeness of God. Anytime that we find ourselves in a situation where the serpent deceives us, we suddenly begin to be not content with the image of God that we were made in and we no longer are operating as image bearers, pointing glory to the king, we start taking the glory to ourselves. So anytime you find yourself taking the, the glory that belongs to the creator and you, you desire to take his place, because that's really what you're doing anytime you're pointing to self instead of to Jesus, yeah. anytime you're disobeying him, right, and not fulfilling that which he's asked you to do, okay, and, and it fits really good here. The truth is they have no teachers in the class because we don't have enough people obeying the assignment on their life to go down the hall and serve. So there won't be a class until the serving team members respond. But if you're already serving, we're not talking to you because you're already doing the assignment on your life. It's the people that are not obeying what God has called them to do. But see, this is part of part of it because the serpent deceives us into believing oh well I'm too busy for that or I don't have to do that or someone else will do it or I hate kids well maybe it's a great opportunity for God to work in your heart and turn that hatred into love because they're children made in his image and likeness and we're supposed to love each other anyway let's go to the table Good. <clears throat> so at the cross of Jesus Christ, his body was broken so that we can be made whole. In every aspect, our image that we carry with us today is because of the cross. When we take of the bread, 
break it as a symbol of his broken body. And we reflect. And for me right now, since we just had the encounter in, in the cross session, they show the picture of Jesus receiving the beatings. <clears throat> so it's fresh on my mind. But I picture it all the time when we take the bread, just remembering, meditating on that. What incredible love, what incredible sacrifice so that I can carry the image that he has given me with boldness, with confidence, knowing that he's already paid for it. It's already done. So, Jesus Christ, we thank you for your broken body, for your sacrifice. And all we can say is thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for loving me so dearly, so deeply. Thank you for dying for me. We honor you. We serve you. And we embrace who we are because of who you made us and because of who you are. In Jesus' name. Fathers, we have the cup in our hands representing the blood of the new covenant. I thank you that you've placed your conviction in our hearts to do the right thing. And I thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit who convicts us of what is true and what is right. <clears throat> Father, you do not operate through manipulation or shame, but you work through truth. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word that we've talked about today, that we were made in the image and likeness of the creator, of you, God. And I thank you that as you lived among us, you demonstrated for us concepts of forgiveness and love, brokenness. You endured pain and suffering, just like we endure pain and suffering. You were you were taken advantage of and betrayed and mistreated, just like some of us are at times. But Father, we look to you today. We look to the cross of Jesus, that his blood cleanses us, restores us to wholeness. And Lord, we can commit today before you to be obedient to those things you've asked us to do so that we can complete the assignment you've placed on us. those things that you've asked us to do, to love you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, to love our neighbor as ourself, love God, love others. Those things, Lord, that you've asked us to do, to go and take the message of hope and share it with others, the message about Jesus and how he died for them sacrificially. I thank you, Lord, that we could have the courage to do that as image bearers and that we represent you everywhere that we go excellence and with authority and with power and with love and humility and that you the God of peace are reigning supreme in our lives so father I thank you that you've liberated us from the curse you set us free from sickness and sin and disease and that you've set us on the path of right living and that we your people are responding to truth from your word and that we can Come anything that the enemy sets in our path in Jesus' name. Wow, that was a that was a really good word. Thank you, Pastor RJ. Thank you, Pastor Larry. You know, um, when pastors get up here, they, they say a lot. There's a lot that they're talking about. But I believe as a body, when we get together, 
It's about chewing on what we hear. And you're not going to remember everything, but you're asking the Holy Spirit, what is it you have for me today? What pieces can I take away and apply to my life and my walk today? So we have to chew. We have to chew on what we hear. Because who's responsible for our growth? Who's responsible for our maturity? We are. So we take what we hear, we chew on it, we apply it to our lives, and we grow as a result. And so we're chewing today, and as I, they've said a lot, and, you know, they talked about being familiar with the enemy's schemes and knowing the truths so that we can discern the lies, right? They also talked about courage and hope in Christ and that we don't want to be deceived by the subtle twists of the enemy. So as we go through the series, this is what they want us to focus on. But here's what I heard as sort of a, a key point in my walk as I'm taking away. Because I'm asking myself, am I, am I an image bearer? Am I an image bearer? And I understand that there, there's, a degree, there's degrees to this. Because to the degree that I'm restored is the answer to the question, am I an image bearer? And I, I heard, we're made in the image of God. And we are in restored relationship with our Father so that we can reflect him properly and govern according to our original design. That's what I heard. So to the degree that we are unrestored, we strive to be God and not reflect the image of God. So then I ask myself, am I an image bearer? How restored am I? Now, I understand positionally I'm restored. The sacrifice on the cross, me accepting that as truth for my life, that my sins are forgiven, that I now stand in right relationship with him. That is restoration. But there is a working out our salvation, which is a daily process. How much am I allowing the truth of God's word to restore all the places of my life? Because to the degree that I do that, I reflect his image. To the degree that I don't, it's problematic, isn't it? And I'm hearing that those are the very areas that the enemy comes to us in. Those are the very areas where we're susceptible to his deception. Because I'm hearing, if it is possible to deceive us, it's going to come in the unrestored areas. Our identity is constantly being challenged. God's character is constantly being challenged. The goodness of God is constantly being challenged. These are his schemes. This is how he comes at us. And I look at this and I think, attack on image bearers. Who is the enemy? Are you my enemy? Are you my enemy? I have ought with you. I have difficulty with you. But are you my enemy? Who's our enemy? We have but one enemy, the accuser of the brethren. I heard them saying that we are all made in his image whether we are in relationship with him or not. So those of you that are not in relationship with him, the fact that you're not doesn't make you my enemy. And so when you have ought with someone, there is a tendency to maybe think of them as the enemy. But I've learned to, to receive what's happening in my life from the perspective of our Father. Is what they're saying true? Is this, what's this difficulty showing me about me? What's this difficulty showing me about what is unpleasant in me that needs to go? Because what's this walk about? Except becoming more and more and more like him. So there are places in us that are unrestored, amen? That need to be restored. And we need to submit to that. Because as the song said earlier, it's, I live within your love, overwhelmed by who you are. 
My desire is to know you deeper. And as you get deeper and deeper with him and allow those places to be restored, you do a better job of reflecting his image to a lost and dying world. Because those people that you think are your enemy, they're the Pauls in your life, possibly. I heard Pastor talk about it. They don't know who they are yet. Wasn't that Paul? Paul's influenced my life. Has he influenced yours? He wrote a lot of that Bible. So we need to pray for them. And the other thing I, I kind of heard that spoke to me in the biggest way was about understanding our weapons. There are two weapons we have. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. The blood of the lamb we talked about, that restoration. Understand your value. Understand your worth. For God so loved the world, and I insert this, for God so loved Desmond that he gave his only begotten son. But Desmond could believe in him, and Desmond could have everlasting life. I am a person of value, and I can add value to people every day. So know your worth. And I can do all things through Christ who is my strength, right? But here's the second thing, the word of your testimony, and I shared this in the the first service. How many of you know what a Walkman is? (laughs) How many of you know about cassette tapes? (laughs) <laughs> oh, I guess you're all old, just like me. That's <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> when I was running track and field when I was younger, um, nationally and internationally, I found that I would get very nervous on race day. And so what I did in the quiet, when I was practicing, all by myself, is I, I did a, a self-tape. I recorded, Desmond, you've done the work. Desmond, you've been gifted by God. Desmond, you are able to do this. You will be the first to 10, to 20, to 50. When you cross the finish line, the people will be behind you. I did all this because I knew on race day I'd get nervous and I'd have doubts. So I'd put the tape on. And while everybody's listening to their pump-up music, I was talking to myself. That's what I was listening to. So they'd come and say, hey, what are you listening to? Oh, no, no, you don't want to listen to this. You don't want to listen to this. This is for me. Because you need to talk to yourself. So what am I saying there? You need to apply the truth of God's word to your life. God is the same yesterday, today, and what he did for you yesterday, what he's doing for you now, he will do for you in your future. Speak the word of truth over your life and see freedom come into your life. Amen? I'm going to leave you with a scripture to bless you. But after the service, our leaders will be here to pray for you to intercede with you, to stand in the gap for you. So please feel free to come up to the altar. But here's a blessing over you from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. I go up to heaven. You are there. I go to the grave. You are there. I ride the wings of the morning if I dwell by the farthest oceans. Even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I'll skip ahead a little bit. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous how well I know it. And I see some marvelous things out there today. How precious are your thoughts about me, oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. And here it ends. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me 
and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path everlasting. I think that's what pastor's message is saying we ought to do. Windsor Christian Fellowship, you have been equipped. Now go. Amen.